to another program of Issues in the News. To those of you who are joining us on Facebook feed from across the Caribbean, North America, Europe, Asia, and I know as far as Australia and New Zealand, welcome to another program of Issues in the News. So please, as I would normally say, press that share button on your phone to ensure that this program is shared with your friends and your followers so that we can have the largest possible audience. And I see in the house Parvati Parvo, Narissa Ali, Shafiq, Shafi from Florida, Omar Sharif, Leonorine Alfred, Arjun Jawahir, Jasmine Baldeo, Judy Bal, Balchan Lalchan from Toronto, Shamo Gear from New York, and the audience is building. Please press that share button on your phone so that this program is going to be shared with your friends and with your audience, with your followers. John Mirai from Canada, Lancelot King, um, Lance, welcome, Pam Singh from New York, Hans Raj, Angela. Sultan, Gayatri Singh, Suraj Nath, and so many of you, Isa Duki from Queens, and the crowd is building as I would like it, because as I said, I want to get as many views and many viewers as possible. Flatty Singh from the ACG in the United States of America, Mavis Bhagwandas, Mavis, welcome. Come to Danny from Brampton, Neville Swami. Neville, <laughs> Neville is from Toronto as well. Mukesh Sarju, Deoram Ramsarup, Arjun Rajkumar, Arjun Iqbal Mohammed, Luana Rodriguez, Nisha Sharma also from Toronto, Navi Chan from Toronto, Ramjit Ramlal. And so many of you, welcome once again to another program of Issues in the News. And one of the reasons why I am inspired and I'm encouraged to keep this program going is when I meet Guyanese, wherever I go and wherever they live, so many of them inform me that they watch this program every Tuesday evening and when they can't get to watch it on a Tuesday, they watch it back as soon as they get the opportunity. And that is a great encouragement for me to be here every single Tuesday to speak to you. I met hundreds, if not thousands, of Guyanese visiting from across the Caribbean, visiting from North America, from New York, from Florida, from um, Atlanta, from Brooklyn, from Toronto, from Winnipeg, all over from the United Kingdom, from Amsterdam, Holland. They all came to Guyana to look at the cricket and to visit beautiful Guyana during the period of the, critic, the cricket carnival. And many, many of them met with me and they informed me that they look at this program, they get a lot of information from this program, they enjoy this program, and that is, to me, the greatest inspiration and the greatest form of gratitude for me to continue to inform you and speak to you on a weekly basis. I hope that many of you would have enjoyed your stay here in Guyana. I know most of you are back home in your respective countries where you have adopted, but I know that you are Guyanese, and I know that you have enjoyed your brief stay in Guyana, and of course we welcome you not only until next year, but next week if you wish, but next year carnival, cricket carnival is going to be bigger and grander than this year, and we expect even more of you to be part of our celebrations. As I said, I know that you have a great, you had a great time in Guyana. 
all the hotels were filled, the stadium was filled on most occasions, I saw the bars filled, the restaurants sold out, I couldn't even get bread to buy one morning, so that was how, what, that is how it was in Guyana for, during that period. The government worked hard, our ministers, our public servants, our policemen, our medical personnel, our private sector, every sector of our country joined hands together to welcome the world to Guyana. And I think that we did well. I think we acquitted ourselves with distinction as a country and as a people. We joined hands and we made Guyana a very hospitable place and a very enjoyable destination for you. And we pledge to continue to do so as long as possible. So I know that you know that the Cricket Carnival was a massive success. We put Guyana on the global stage once again, and there were so many people, so many international press here, all the hotels were sold out, all the players who came here from across the world, they enjoyed themselves, and the cricket carnival was a tremendous and resounding success. Guyana, of course, did not make it to the final once again. That is a colossal disappointment for us, and I know for you all, fans of the Amazon Warriors, but we didn't make it to the finals. And I want to salute Jamaica, the Jamaica Talawas, and Krishna Prasad, the owner of the Jamaica Talawas, Shivnarayan Chandapal, the head coach, Courtly Ambrose, the bowling coach, and of course, the players of the Jamaican Talawas for a job well done. Jamaica Talawas, as you know, is owned by a Guyanese and is coached by a Guyanese. And if I had to choose a second team to support, other than, of course, the Amazon Warriors of Guyana, I would have chosen, and I chose, the Jamaica Talawas, and they won. So congratulations, Jamaica Talawas, for a job well done. And we had a very rollicking hectic, hard-working, but enjoyable two weeks. A lot of hard work, a lot of planning went into the events, and it was really a spectacle to watch it unfold and take pride in all the hard work that we did as a people and as a government to see it being a resounding success that it was. So congratulations to all my ministerial colleagues, of course, His Excellency the President, who led from the front, and he perhaps the most, he more than most enjoyed himself, as you would have seen in all the pictures, but it was well-deserved enjoyment. He led from the front, this was his idea, and he pulled it off. Excellent leadership from the President and the government of Guyana, but of course, we could not have done it without the tens of thousands of Guyanese who worked to make this possible and to have accommodation ready, to clean the place up, and to do all that was necessary to make this the great spectacle that it was. Next year, as I said, we pledge to make it bigger, and we expect to see more and more of you visiting us as the competition will grow, the carnival will grow, the tourism product will grow, and the economy and all our accommodating and other uh, capabilities will grow as we grow from strength to strength. So I see people congratulating on the screen, Shiv Narayan Chandapal and Courtly Ambrose and Chris Passad and the Jamaica Talawas, and rightfully so. They played like the champions and they were eventually crowned the champions. So, having gotten that out of the way, I want to continue to inform you that the Gas to Shore project is moving apace. As you saw over the weekend, we met with a second grouping of landowners who were affected, and as a government, we pledge to ensure that we work with every single landowner 
to arrive at a consensual position respecting their proprietary interest, respecting the value for their land, ensuring that they are adequately and properly compensated, and most importantly, ensure that we arrive at consensual positions, amicable resolutions, as we don't wish to exercise, or the state doesn't wish to exercise its powers under the doctrine of eminent domain and seize anybody's land using any form of force or appropriating mechanisms. We prefer to sit with every single citizen, work out an arrangement that they find acceptable. If they want money, they will get money. If they want alternative lands, they will get alternative lands. So we want to arrive at consensual positions. And that is why we change the law to remove it from the investor and put the power in the hands of the government to do these negotiations. Up to a year ago, the law had vested that power in the investor in the oil and gas industry. We felt that no investor would take the care that the government would, and no investor would exercise the patience that the government would in ensuring that these people's rights are respected and to ensure that we arrive at amicable resolutions in relation to these transactions. The government took on that power legally and is discharging that power, and I dare say is discharging it well, and to the satisfaction, most importantly, of the persons whose proprietary interests are affected. This is a multi-billion dollar project, as you know. The pipeline will run from 120 miles out in the Atlantic Ocean, inland to another, uh, for another 60 or thereabouts, I'm not sure, but about 30 miles inland, but 120 miles coming in from the ocean, and then straight to the seat of the oil to, ga oil to, the gas to shore project in the vicinity of what used to be the Wales Sugar Estate, multi-billion dollar undertaking. And we are committed to this. This is a, a transformational project, not only for Guyana, but for the Caribbean, for southern Brazil, and possibly as far as Latin America, Suriname, French Guyana. That is the magnitude of this project. This is not a... <coughs> This is by no means or measure to be executed. One of the largest investments in decades to be executed in the Caribbean region. And therefore, that is why we have to ensure that nothing stands in the way of this project. And the investors are investing billions of dollars here. And the government has to work with the investor to ensure that the project becomes a reality. And who will benefit the most from the project? the ordinary Guyanese. It is intended to reduce the cost of energy, the cost of cooking gas, the cost of natural gas, to a fraction of what it currently is. Bring it, in, it is intended to bring down the cost of electricity, the cost of energy, to a fraction of what it currently is. And it is only when we are able to bring that cost of energy down, then we will be able to unleash the gigantic agricultural potential that we know Guyana possesses. It is only when we are able to bring down that cost of energy, then we will be able to make Guyana not only the food basket of the Caribbean, but the food basket of Latin America and possibly South America, and of course, to the Guyanese communities in North America. And that is the dream, that is the ideal, that is the plan to which we are working. That is it. 
to make Guyana that place that will be feeding the Caribbean and all of its neighbors. We have the potential to do so. One of the major obstacles standing in our way is the cost of electricity. And then you will see what we will do in the manufacturing sector, the productive sector, the agro-processing sector, all Guyana's potential that we all know Guyana is possessed of will be unleashed once we are able to tackle the serious issue of cost of energy. Hence, the mammoth nature of this investment. And of course, we have critics. Critics are criticizing us, but we are going ahead. They have criticized us on almost everything that we have done. When we were building the Marriott, they said that they're going to make it into a daycare center. They said that it's going to be a colossal failure. Today, the Marriott doesn't have rooms to accommodate the people who are flooding this land. When we build the Barbies Bridge, they abused and possibly voted us out of government because of that. Today, the Barbies Bridge is a godsend for the people who have to use that crossing and don't have to rely on hours and hours on the ferry. When we were building the stadium, they said that we are building a white elephant. And look at what the stadium has done for us now. 15 years ago, they said that it's a white elephant. Why are we building a stadium? Nobody will come to Guyana. That is the visionlessness. That is the backwardness. That is the lack. <laughs> That is the kind of people that we are dealing with. So <clears throat> they are cussing and condemning the gas to shore project. They managed to kill the Amila Falls project today. Were the Amila Falls project up and running since 2018, we would have been having electricity from that project. And by 2025, which is two years from now, the electricity cost would have been 20% of what it is now. It would have been 20%. So, that is what we have to deal with. That is what, no, about 50%, sorry, that is what I was concentrating on. By 2025, the energy cost would have been less than half, less than half of what it is now if the Amila Falls project was not killed by APNU AFC. By 2018, 2017, we would have gotten our first kilowatt of energy from that project. And that is how they are. So anything we do, they are there to condemn. They have no vision. They don't see. They can't see into the future. They don't have the ability to. So all these projects that we are doing, they are condemning one after the other. The airport project, they said, is a waste of time. And you will see all the hotels that, they are, that we are building, they are condemning them one after the other. One after the other, they are condemning. Badal himself, he was in politics at one point in time. He condemned the Marriott, but he had his own reason. He was, he was condemning the Marriott, and then he went and he built a hotel but two times or three times the size of the Marriott, and it is filled. It is filled. Read what, what Badal used to say about the Marriott when we were building the Marriott. He was saying that the Marriott will never get people. We don't have the, the, the traffic to accommodate a Marriott. In addition to the Marriott, he went on to build a hotel three times the size of the Marriott, and that is also being filled. I say that to you so that when you hear these people speak, you ignore them. You ignore them and you express your sympathy for them. Because I don't know if they are born like that, but they have no vision. They are not achievers, so they are not accustomed to seeing others achieve and not accustomed to seeing achievement anywhere. But let me see your views. So, Yes, this gentleman is saying the airport has to be extended. 
<laughs> that may very well, we may very well have to do that. That is the rate at which the country is growing. So we can't spend our energy dealing with the negatives. We have to build a country. These guys have nothing to do and they have all day to do it. We have to work every single day to push the agenda of this country forward. And that is what we pledge to the people to do. And that is what we are committed to do. And every day you watch your Facebook page, every day you watch the internet, every day you go and look in the media, and you will see the government of Guyana, our shoulders to the wheel, along with similar-minded Guyanese, pushing progress forward, while we have a set of naysayers and losers just lamenting their own woes and screaming about discrimination and racism and bloated lists. That is all I can hear them say. They have nothing that comes out from their mouth other than negativity, racism, and a bloated list. But I'll deal with that as I go on. So two weeks ago, I announced, as we continue our transformational our transformational journey. I announced that the Council of Legal Education will write Guyana to formally inform Guyana that Guyana will be considered by the Council of Legal Education for the establishment of a law school. And that the Council of Legal Education will also inform Guyana of the specifications and the requirements which will have to be met by the government of Guyana for such a law school to be established here. I made it clear that the government of Guyana is not pursuing a Guyanese law school, but a law school to be run by the Council of Legal Education of the Caribbean. The Council of Legal Education of the West Indies is the institution which by law and by treaty owns and operates the law schools in the region and administers and manages legal education in the region. And I made sure that I made it clear that Guyana will continue to be part of that regional umbrella, that we will not act insularly, but we will act as a part of a collective, that we don't want a law school here that will not be part of the Council of Legal Education, but we want the Council Law School here. <coughs> because that Council Law School has international standing. It has academic risk, it has respect in the academic world. And we want a law school here that will have that type of academic respect in the international arena that its graduates will be recognized by countries across the world as the con other councils law school are recognized. I said also that this school, as you know, there is a serious problem of overcrowding at the Norman Manley Law School and at the U. Wooding Law School. Norman Manley is in Kingston, Jamaica, and U. Wooding is in St. Augustine, Trinidad. And there is a serious overcrowding in those two law schools. Those two law schools cannot accommodate the hundreds and hundreds of students churned out by University of the West Indies, University of Guyana, University of Jamaica, University of Trinidad and Tobago, University of London, and other universities across North America and the United Kingdom. You have a backlog of thousands of persons with LLB degrees from recognized universities, both within <clears throat> and without the region. 
but they can't get into these law schools. There is a law school at, in the Bahamas, in Nassau, Bahamas, Eugene Dupuc Law School, Dupuch Law School, but unfortunately, that law school is not attracting the number of students that it was expected it should attract or it would have attracted. So the two law schools, U. Wooding and Norman Manley, are left to bear this heavy burden and they have not been able to take off this load. And as a result, you have in Guyana alone, possibly over 200 or 300 persons who have LLB degrees, but have not been able to go to a law school. You have a few hundreds, if not thousands in Trinidad. You have a few thousands in Jamaica and the rest of the Caribbean. And then you have so many other people so this law school will be able to address the backlog of existing students. And once you have a third law school, a third viable law school that has the capability to accommodate persons, then the intake in the universities are going to increase because the, there is a guaranteed outlet. And Guyana will now become part of that solution and we expect that hundreds of people are going to come here, students from across the region and North America. And that is part of our government's vision of making Guyana an education destination in this part of the world. It is part of making Guyana an education destination we are already in the process of attracting many offshore universities of international standing and reputation to come and establish operations here. This law school will be another incarnate, another extension of that initiative which we are pursuing. When we bring people to this country, they will spend money here, they will rent, they will live here, and that brings revenue to the country and there's another stream of revenue that we are pursuing. So from every perspective, Guyana as a country and Guyanese will benefit spectacularly from this initiative. I pause here to show the difference between us and the APNU, AFC. Recall when they were in government, their attorney general, without consulting the Council of Legal Education, apparently he doesn't know and doesn't under, did not understand how the system works and how legal education is administered and managed in the region. He went and allied himself with some unknown entity called Law School of Americas sign a memorandum of understanding with this institution called Law School of Americas and went ahead and turned the sod at some university to open a law school without even informing the council, more so consulting with the council. When I made it public that you cannot do this, this thing has to be done with the auspices of the council or at least inform the council that you are breaking away from the region because Guyana is part of that regional institution. I don't, it's either ignorance or folly. I don't know which one and I don't know which is worse. But of course, when he realized, when I made it public, that this thing can't be done without the council knowing, when he went to the council meeting, the people rejected everything that he had to say. They were disrespected and he wanted, he didn't want, he wanted to bring this alien organization in. Nobody knew who, where this organization is from. I don't know what its recognition is, what recognition it, it, it had in the world of academia. And he already made arrangements with this unknown entity called Law School of Americas. 
and the Council of Legal Education rightfully <coughs> excuse me rejected all his attempts out of hand. They were not going to tolerate him and tolerate that bombardment and that kind of bullying. And of course, if you look back in the, law, in the reports in the press, he abused and violated the people, the Congress of Legal Education. But that is how AP and new AFC, that is how they operate. They are wrong, they are stupid, they are incompetent, and when they don't get their way, they break down and they bully and they threaten and they want to commit violence. That is their modus operandi. We all know that. They go to the elections, they lose, hell break loose. They get robbed, they want to burn, they want to beat, they want to rob, and that is the story of the party. And that is how they manage the country, that is how they execute their projects. They must get their way. <coughs> They don't understand that this is a civilized world. And in a civilized world, barbaric behavior is not countenanced. Buffoonery is not countenanced. Ignorance is not tolerated. They are still in that stage. And whenever you tell them that, somehow you're, you, you are being racist. They use those very labels they have just said, and they say that these are racist labels. I am not, I am not attacking any race. I am attacking this grouping of people masquerading as leaders of AP and UAFC. And I am saying that they have a history and a track record of incompetence, of failures, of bullyism, of violence and of victimhood and I have no qualms about that and I can give you examples from now till thy kingdom come to support my contentions and you live through all of this you know what I'm speaking about <clears throat> so work will begin shortly on meeting the requirements set out by the Council in that correspondence to the government of Guyana, which I received last week. So the Guyana Law School is well on its way. The Guyana Regional Law School is well on its way. So, I saw a great moment being made of the second elections petition that was recently called in the Court of Appeal. Now, these guys are saying that their appeals, their, well, you know that one appeal was struck out for non-service. They appealed to the Court of Appeal. We took an objection to the jurisdiction of the court. The Court of Appeal ruled against us, and we have appealed to the CCJ, and we are awaiting a ruling from the CCJ. The second appeal now, they are saying that every day they want, they're talking about their appeal must be heard, their appeal must be heard. Well, who's stopping their appeal from being heard? They sat down, and twiddle their thumbs for 19 months without doing anything to get their appeal heard. But as usual, they're cussing the world that their appeal is not being heard. If you want your appeal to be heard, you must be competent enough to know what you have to do to get your appeal to be heard. Any competent lawyer would know that if you want an appeal be heard, you file a motion to the Court of Appeal to say, look, Court of Appeal, this is an important matter. This is a matter of national importance, and I want it to be heard. You don't go and cry at Congress place. You don't go and cry on TV. You don't go and cry on all these, on these street corners. 
that your appeal is not being heard, when the place where you have to go and make your case is the court system. So for 19 months, they did nothing. And then all of a sudden, they filed a motion. So Mr. Mendez, myself, and all the respondents, except respondent David Granger said, you know, two years have already elapsed. The government is there. Election petition laws say that elections petition must be heard early because it is important that the composition of the government be settled early, that the composition of the National Assembly be settled early, that the comp the composition of the regional bodies be settled early because elections produce all of these things. <clears throat> and if you have an election petition, the law says that it must be heard expeditiously. And if it is not being heard, then you have a duty to prosecute it and ensure that it is heard expeditiously. And you can't come 19 months after, 19 months after, after sitting down and doing nothing, and we said that it should not be heard. That was the argument we advanced. Lawyers have a duty to put forward every argument that is, that is available at law for their client. They always have to ensure that they act in their client's interest. So we put forward our arguments. The court didn't agree with us. The court didn't agree with us. The court said, no, we will hear the petition. We have no problem with that. We have no problem with that. So we will go and have the petition heard. And we will take it from there. When I saw all kinds of remarks are being made in the newspapers and in the public domain and in the social media, that we, want, we don't want their petition to be heard. We don't control the pace at which your petition should be heard. We don't control whether we want your petition to be heard. How we can control whether we want your petition to be heard? If I had control of it, I'd throw it out a long time ago because I believe it's complete, completely without merit. But I don't have that power. But you have a responsibility. You file it. You have to prosecute it vigilantly and diligently. You can't sit down nine, 19 months and then suddenly wake up like Rip Van Winkle and you want the world to run at, at your beck and call. It doesn't operate like that. So we, had, we did what we had to do, and the court made its ruling, and we are going to go to court and go to the, have the, the, the appeal heard and the date fixed by the court. We have no difficulty with that, and we will deal with the consequences from there. But what I want to tell you, what I want to assure you, that in the end, both will be lost. That is what I know. Both will be lost. <clears throat> So, as I said earlier, all the AP and UAFC can speak about is bloated list and they're crying this victim story. <laughs> this victim story that they were robbed at the elections. And it's like they don't get tired. You know, they don't get tired of this thing. You saw everything that happened and they continue. So Norton today said that they wrote Claudette Singh, chairperson of GCOM, and they asked Claudette Singh to send all, the, they apparently they sent some additional names now of dead people and voters impersonation and they want Justice Claudet Singh to send it to the <coughs> police for investigation and to the GRO. And apparently the chairperson of GCOM sent it. And I'm happy that she did. Because it's more fraud we will be able to unearth. Because you know and I know that they lost the election squarely and fairly. So the more information they give is the more inaccuracy we will be able to unearth. So I am happy that they are digging up there. They are helping us, in other words. They are helping us to show them how they are fraudulent. 
But I don't know how they know that those persons voted. So they lost the elections by 15,000 votes. As I said on a program before, they, I believe they sent about 400 names. Let us say all the names. We give them all the 400 votes. They lost by 15,000. So basically they are saying that on election day, 15,000 persons impersonated voters across this country. Well, they were once saying that 15,000 dead people voted. Now I think they are saying that 15,000 persons impersonated. In other words, 15,000 persons voted. I don't know, voted twice? Or didn't vote for themselves and vote for someone else? These guys don't even sit down to listen to what, them, what they say. So each polling station has, and you all voted, and I'm just refreshing your memory. Just for one moment, reflect back to when you voted, and you will see how foolish and clumsy the lie is. So when you voted, you had to take out, first of all, in the voting station, you have each political party have a polling agent. Each political party has a polling agent. Each political party has an, each um, polling place has an assistant presiding officer and a presiding officer. So you already have about five, six, seven people in the polling station. They are a big party. They are supposed to have, and they control the GCOM machinery. So they have their polling agent there. And you know, Lowenfield was there by. <clears throat> Mingo was there by. And the entire machinery they control. So, I don't know in the face of this how 15,000 cases of voter impersonation is possible. So let me refresh your memory. You go with your, you first of all have to find your name on the list outside of the polling booth. So only that polling booth you can go to. You go there, you present your ID card. They check your ID card against a folio. So your ID card is already on a folio there. So they look at your name. They look at your photograph. They look at your date of birth and all the information corresponds. Then they announce it aloud. Every one of the, their agents, all the polling agents, the presiding officer, everybody got a list. The list that is posted outside that your name is on. So they say Anil Nandlal, and they all tick off, and then you get a ballot. And all of them tick off on that list. Then you get a ballot, you go in the place and you mark the ballot, and you put it in the box. When you finish, you take your finger and you put it in that indelible ink. And then you leave that station. When, they, when you leave there, they take up your folio, and they remove it. They put it to one side. So the next folio is there now. So the next person comes and he goes through that whole process. How can you come again? How can you turn up at another polling station? Your hand has that ink. Your name is not on that list. You can't have a folio two place. How can you go to another polling station? Where will they, where will they find the folio? <clears throat> how, how is this even possible? And this is the craziness that they sit down weekly and speak about at press conferences. And Norton 
in particular. This, I don't think this guy understands anything about elections. Well, I don't, I don't know what he understands. The, very, the reporters are trying to tell him things and he's barking at the reporters. So he says that the list is bloated. Now, we have called upon GCOM to remove all the dead people from the list. So we have no problem with We tell GCOM, the law says, remove all the dead people. The law says that right now. And we are amending the law to compel them to do that. But you cannot remove from the list persons who are resident overseas. The law does not permit that. And there is a ruling from a court from Chief Justice George to that effect. That to remove persons who are not resident in Guyana from the list would be to disenfranchise those persons. Because residency is not a requirement to be on the list, is not a requirement to vote, and is not a requirement to remove persons on the list. And that is what I can't get into the thick skull. That's why I went to court in 2019, and I obtained a declaration from the court they were in, so incompetent, they didn't even appeal it if they wished to appeal it. They did not appeal it. <clears throat> but they would have lost because that is the law. So when Norton says, so the, the, the process of continuous registration, one of the characteristics of the process is that it will have people named on the list who are more than the voting population especially in a migratory society. And I have said, I have asked them to go and check the entire Caribbean where there is a similar system of continuous registration where residency is not a requirement either to be on the list or to vote that you will see in every single Caribbean territory. There are extra persons on the list, more persons on the list than voting population. That is an acceptable characteristic of the continuous registration system. And this very bloated list that they keep speaking about is the very bloated list that won them one seat majority in 2011. It's the very bloated list that won them the elections in 2015. <clears throat> It wasn't bloated then. It's the same list. Now, <clears throat> the claims and objection period is on. So, Norton was called upon as he's saying that the list is bloated and it got people who are dead and so on who should be removed from the list. The G comes issued a statement and said, use the claims and objection period and go and remove the bloat. Today, in his press conference, he said he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. He, does, he can't do that because what he's saying is not right. He can't do it. One, be lazy. That's the first thing. He is lazy, so he doesn't want to go and do any work. <clears throat> what he's alleging is not true, so he can't go and remove nobody off the list legally to, through the claims and objection period. So he now says today at this press conference that they are not participating in the claim and objection. So somebody must do the work for these people. Whereas in 2015, you would recall, they took 1,500 names of Amerindians who were living at Morakabai, that's the mission of Maikoni Creek, and said that those people were dead. They took 1,500 names. The same Carol Joseph, who is writing GCAM, she lodged <coughs> an objection against 1,500 Amerindian brothers and sisters' names on the list at Morakabai, claiming that they were dead. We had to bring the 1,500 people down with boat 65 miles up the Maikoni River and bring them to Region 5. 
to show that they were alive to reject their claim. How they did it then. Now you are claiming that you are a victim. That 15,000 persons or hundreds of thousands according to Norton are extra on the list. Why don't you go and just go to the claims and objection and lodge your objection? Take the name off. I say, look, G come. I have a hundred thousand here who shouldn't be on the list. I let G come go do the work. Lodge a hundred thousand claim. If you say the list is bloated by a hundred thousand, that is what the claims and objection is intended for. It is to lay a claim or to object. So you, Norton, uh, contention is one of an objection. He says that they got 200, I don't know was he 100, how much, how many, but according to him, about 200,000 or more <coughs> names on the list. All he got to do is take them off and go, go to the claims and objection and say, look, all these people should not be on the list. Are you telling me he can't, he, he's, in, he's so incompetent that he cannot do that? The truth of the matter is that they are making the story as they are going. They can't face the electorate. And that is the truth. But they want government. They want government, but they don't want to win an election. They cannot win an election. They want government by a method other than the ballots. So I heard him with his usual threats. threatening that he will do this and I, 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 <clears throat> <clears throat> nobody takes Norton seriously I am just spending the time here and the energy here so that you can understand so that the more and more you expose him the less and less people will look at him and that I suppose is part of my political responsibility Every single argument he advances can so easily be dissected, deconstructed, and demolished. Every single one of them. I have not heard a single <clears throat> intelligent argument advanced by this leader of the opposition. Not once. So, <clears throat> they continue to attack the chairperson of GCOM, and to attack GCOM. They continue to spin their mantra of racism. And that is all that they do. You take those two things away from them and they are quiet. They don't say anything. They have nothing else to say. Nothing to say in terms of an alternative government policy. Nothing to say in terms of an alternative economic strategy. Nothing to say in terms of an alternative social policy. No advice, no guidance, no alternative plan for the development of this country. Other than race. And according to them, only black people live in Guyana. And I say that with the greatest of respect to my Afro-Guyanese brothers and sisters. The PNC only speaks about one race. To them, no other race exists. I don't exist. Amerindians don't exist. Portuguese don't exist. Whites don't exist. Chinese don't exist. Only afro Guyanese. That's all that they speak about. So I don't know how the other supporters of theirs are even, how they feel how they feel. Because every time these guys speak and any other, any policy of this government directed <clears throat> to any other ethnic group other than Afro-Guyanese, the policy is, is racist. Any other ethnic grouping benefit from anything, it's racist. These guys are demented. It is, I don't, it is a form of, it's a mental aberration. I, I don't know how else to describe it. My 
operator is signaling to me that we are rapidly coming out down to to program time. I want to clarify something. I got a note here <clears throat> to say that because of the intervention of the government, there has been a reduction in fuel prices. Gasoline has moved from 269 per liter to 215 per liter at all guy oil gas station. From 269 per liter to 215 per liter. And diesel from 265 per liter to 255 per liter. 265 per liter to 255 per liter. And this is at all <coughs> guy oil gas stations. Some controversy erupted because when the announcement was made, persons went to the pumps at guy oil gas station but did not get the prices announced. The reason being, I'm told, is that the those guy oil gas stations that are leased, the operators explained that they had some fuel from the day before and they were given a period of time to sell off the fuel. <clears throat> so I am, I am told that by tomorrow, <clears throat> that fuel that would have been purchased at a cheaper price, a more expensive price, sorry, they would have been sold out. So as from tomorrow, the price, these adjusted prices should be available at the pumps at all guy oil gas station. This is where I have to say good evening and thank you very much for spending the past hour with me. I'm a little under the weather, still recovering from the cricket carnival. My voice is a little um, damaged and I may have a slight flu, but I'm surviving and I came here to do the program notwithstanding that I may not be in top form. But I think we had a good program and I want to thank you very much and please enjoy the rest of the week.